Can you hear me all right? Amen. It's good to be back with you. I, uh, of course, we're missionaries in Mongolia, and our our major, uh, it's not the only thing we do, but it's our major occupation over there, is printing God's Word and getting that out. And we've been there 18 years. Uh, we've had struggles through the years, obviously, as any other missionaries had. One of our biggest struggles has been a building. Uh, we've got the equipment. We didn't have the building. And, when, no, about two years ago, well, next month will be two years ago, we were able to acquire a building there in Mongolia. Actually, it was built by an American missionary uh, 17 years ago. Ironically, I was there for the groundbreaking of the building. Amen. And uh, uh, they had used it for several years. Then they, he had to go home. He passed on to another missionary. They used it for a couple years. There was a church in the building. And then he went home, and then another missionary came in and had for a couple years, and then he combined it with another church and moved it in closer to the city center. So the building had been vacant for eight or nine years. Uh, no heating system in it whatsoever, no water, never was water in it. The electric was spotty at best. And so what we did... Hey, it's working. And so what what we did, we acquired a building. I talked to the man that owns it. He's a pastor now out in the San Diego, California area. And when I called him on the phone, here's what he said to me. His name is Jeff, by the way. I like it. Well, let me rephrase it. I, I don't understand this. I've never asked him. I probably should. His name in Mongolia is Jeff, but when he's back here, it's Scott. I don't know who he's hiding from. I'll ask him someday. But anyway, but, so I called him and I began to talk to him about the building. I told him what we wanted to do and everything. He said, here's what I want you to do. He said, I'll sell it to you for $60,000. But he said, I don't want a penny until you're completely done and producing God's Word. He said, when you've got everything finished and when it's all up and running, then you, you worry about me then. And he signed the building and everything over to me. So it's already in our names. You know, so God's good. He was going ahead of us. I want to show you the building. There was a lot of work. The building had been left empty. It actually been just used like a warehouse uh, the last several years. And uh, I'm going to show you the video. And then I'll come back and explain a few more things to you. And then I'll a answer questions. How's that? If you have any.
says, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Mongolia needs God's word. In our stairwell, we have this 700-piece map of Mongolia. Each piece represents $1,000 that has been donated to the ministry. And on each piece is the name of the person, the church, or the company that has donated that money. It reminds us to pray for those that are helping to spread the gospel to these forgotten people in Mongolia. Thank you for your help. We'd like to give a thanks to all those young people that helped us make this possible. What a great bunch of workers. What a great bunch of Christians. Thank you. Special thanks to Tucson and Bill Gay. They're not just workers. They're our partners and they're our friends. God has blessed us greatly in this couple. Thank you. Thank you. We'd like to take this time to thank each one of you that have given money to make this project possible. Spreading the gospel in Mongolia is in big part because of your sacrificial giving. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. See what the building we have now has come a long way. We've got the equipment moved, we've got it in. Uh, it's up and running. They're, they're running as right now. Uh, well, not right now, it's the middle of the night right there, right now, but they will be running tomorrow morning, amen. And uh, God's been good to us. We, we've had some interesting battles. The first battle was the water. Drilling the well wasn't the problem, and the well you can see is only five feet away from the building. How hard is that to get the water from here to here, you know? And then through the building, that should be pretty simple, right? No. And uh, so I hired the first plumber. We went through four, by the way. First one, and he started plumbing the building, got about halfway done and quit. Never seen him again. I don't know what happened to him. I have no idea. Never could find him. And uh, finally I hired a second guy. He finished the plumbing, put the fixtures in, things like that. And you turned the water on, it was like just this little trickle. I mean, two and a half hours to fill a toilet, you know. I mean, come on, you know. And so, needless to say, he didn't last long. And then we hired a third guy. He said, I can get you pressure. Yeah, he blew the back of the toilet right off. I mean, I never seen anything like that. I didn't know you could do that. It was pretty cool, though. I mean, just, oh, there it goes. And uh, so, you know, and I'm, I'm praying to God. I'm saying, Lord, we really do need a plumber. We need somebody who knows what they're doing. I mean, surely somebody in this country knows plumbing. I mean, there's a lot of toilets in this country. And I like one, <laughs> you know. And uh, so I was at the, it's called the Dungeon Ghetto, you know, uh, the black market for, for plumbing supplies and building supplies, things like that. And it's just a huge building with all these little booths in it. And you kind of have to peck and search for what you're looking for. But there's a lady in there that's got a booth that has a lot of plumbing stuff. And I've bought a lot from her. So I went to her first. And I'm trying to convey to her what I'm looking for is a pressure switch and a pressure tank. You know, common sense things, you know, that are not so common in other countries. And uh, I'm talking to her. She's not getting it. I'm not getting what she's saying. Finally, out of frustration, she takes her phone and she dials and just hands it to me. And I pick it up. I say, hello. And this guy in the other goes, hello. <laughs> he starts talking to me in really good English. And he's obviously a Mongolian man. And so we talked for a while, and I told him what I was looking for. He said, how many toilets, how big is the building, you know, all this stuff. And, and finally he says, yeah, you need a 100 bar pressure tank and a pressure switch. I said, yeah, that's exactly right. He goes, she ain't got one. <laughs> I said, well, thank you. And he said, well, you got to go to Hermes. Now, I, I, that, you, that's a store I've been going to for 18 years. I know this place very well. I said, okay, I'm on my way. He said, when you get there, call me, and I will walk you right to where it's at. And so I got there, and sure enough, it was right there. I seen it before. I even called him. I could see it when I walked through the door. And uh, I called him back, and he talked to the lady. We got everything. I headed back to the building, and on the way back, I thought, who is this guy? So I dialed him back. 
struck up a conversation with him. I said, what's your name? He said, my name is Paul Knight. Well, I'm, I'm thinking that's not a Mongolian name at all. Because Ushinbayer, Matbayer, you know, Thukso, those are all Mongolian names, not Paul Knight. It's not, that's a very American name. And I said, well, where did you learn English? He goes, oh, I was raised by missionaries. I said, can we meet, like, right now? <laughs> I need to talk to you. And uh, so we met later on that day. And as he was coming, we were getting ready to meet, I thought, um, I know a Jason Knight. I wonder if there's, you know, I've known Jason Knight. He's another Mongolian I've known for 17 years. And when I met, I, I asked him, I said, do you know Jason Knight? He goes, yeah, that's my brother. Duh. <laughs> So to make a long story short, he's a wonderful Christian young man. He's just been married a short while. His wife speaks English better than he does. They sing. Oh, they're amazing. But he has taken over all my plumbing, my heating, and all that because we heat with a hot water boiler system. And it is all running perfect, young man. And it's great because I can tell him something, and I don't need a translator. And he knows what I'm saying. That's even more amazing. And so God's been very good to us. And uh, we, we found out this year by trying to heat the building through the winter is that we had zero insulation in our roof. I may have told you this to pray about that. We now have insulation in our roof. We were able to get that. We have a concrete roof that's only so thick, which has zero insulation value. And then above that is a gap and then a metal roof that has no insulation. So there's zero insulation value of any of that. And so we had a crew come in, uh, actually we ran in a lift, they come and took the metal off, put all the insulation in, put the metal back on. And it has transformed that building. It's warm. Tuxo said, too hot, too hot. If a Mongolian says that, it's got to be at least 85 because they like it about 80 anyways. And uh, so I said, well, turn it down. You know, there's a thermostat. We can turn this thing down. You know, we don't have to run a full blast. So God's been very good to us. Pray for us. Uh, the last thing we got, we've got just a little bit of room, a little bit to do on it. We have a, a three bedroom, a one bedroom, and then an efficiency apartment on the second floor. And the efficiency apartment needs a shower and then uh, a few other little things, probably between four and five thousand. We'll finish the entire construction end of it done uh, with that. Now we do have to put a third floor on at some point uh, because we don't have enough space, but we're not to that point quite yet. Now we're working on our equipment. We have, uh, we're, we're praying for a digital press. Do you know what a digital color press is? Yeah, do you know what a digital color copier is? They're exactly the same thing. <laughs> Just different words. It's color copier. Uh, we're looking at one of those. It's about $10,000. We actually have half that money been given already to that. So we're praying to get that in. We have five books right now that we can put on that uh, versus the big press. And so the other thing we just found out, we, we're, we're looking into this, we're praying pretty heavily about this. Our press, the big one you saw moving there, that's a 1979 press. It does good on book paper. It's not going to work for Bible paper. Bible paper is much lighter, much more finicky. Uh, book paper has a grain, Bible paper does not, different things like that. Uh, all that makes a, a difference. But there's a press in Mongolia we just found. Uh, there's a young man that we've been dealing with for almost, well, 17 years, and he's become good friends with Tuxo, my pressman, and he called Tuxo. He, he started his own business a couple years back. We buy all our paper and our inks are placed through him. And he said, uh, hey, there's a press here. He said, you really need to look at it because you guys need this thing. It's a two-color Speedmaster Heidelberg, and it's a 2008 model, and it's computerized where the one we have is not computerized, things like that. That that press right now on the market is about $50,000. It's for sale for $35,000 in Mongolia. Now, what that means to me is I don't have to ship it. Number two, I don't have to pay taxes and duty because it's already in the country. Taxes and duties are 28% of whatever you pay for it. So you do the math on that, it's a lot of money. And so it's right there. It can be bought, picked up with a forklift, put on a truck, and brought across town and put it in our building probably within two hours. And so, right electric, everything. So pray for us, we're praying about that. And by the way, I have zero funds towards that because we just found out about this. So keep us in your prayers. God's got big things planned. Um, about four weeks ago, 
the, the man that heads up the translation in Mongolia, he lives in Texas, down in the uh, Fort Worth, Texas area. And he comes over once or twice a year to make sure the Mongolians are still translating the way they're supposed to and double checking what they do and that kind of thing. He called and said, we're coming over, they're gonna be there. Well, next Sunday, they're actually landing in Mongolia. And uh, so he's renting an apartment from us, the translation team is, which is what we want them to do. We give them a good deal. So he sent me a check. Well, we, we left. The check came in. I stuck it in my wallet. We headed for Michigan. We were in Michigan the last three and a half weeks with meetings. And I got up there and I parked behind the church where I always do in Chelsea, Michigan. And I was talking to the preacher the next day. And, and I said, am I going to be the way, in the way out there? He goes, no. He goes, you're not in the way. He says, We've got plenty of room. He said, the only thing going, we got going, we got a missions conference next week. But he said, I said, oh, well, amen. I came at the right time, didn't I? And uh, uh, come to find out that the guest speaker is from Fort Worth, Texas. is Bill Patterson, the man that's the head of our translation department in Mongolia. Amen? And so uh, I got to sit down with Bill for a couple of hours and talk about the translation that's going on over there. And he said at the present speed they're going, and he expects it to go continue that way, it'll be two years and the Old Testament will be finished. So we got two years to get all of our equipment up to speed and get ready to print the uh, whole Bible for the Mongolian people. Amen? And uh, that's just the way God works. You know? And a bill was so funny. He said, oh, did you get that check I sent you? I said, got it. It's in Mongolia and it's already spent. <laughs> you want to know anything else? <laughs> that's how it works. We get the money in, it gets shipped over, and it gets used. Amen? So I, I said a lot real quick. Anybody got any questions? And I'll be more than happy to answer them. And uh, did the video look all right for you? Because that's just the second time I've ever shown that video. So just wanted you to know that. I got a blessing. That right, that computer down there, that's a blessing. I don't know if you remember the computer I did have. It's a little one. And I mean little. And it's a, it says HP on it. It's not. It's a Chinese knockoff, okay? I, I can tell you what it is because I got it in Mongolia. And I've had it seven years, I think, maybe six, six or seven years. It's not doing well. There's tape holding it together and things like that. And I was in a church, the church in Chelsea, Michigan, and I wanted to show the preacher the video. So I met with him in his office, and it takes like 10 minutes to boot that thing up. Sometimes it just doesn't want to start, you know. And, and so I'm going through it. Finally got it up and running, showed him the video, and he said, so what's with the computer? I said, it's dying. We're just need to replace it. Been looking at them for two months and I said just haven't found anything I can afford because I have no money for one. And so we're, we're putting everything into the building at this point. And I went on with it. About an hour later, his assistant pastor called and said, you know, we, we've got this old computer in our church. He said, we've upgraded everything to Macs. He said, we use Mac everything. And he said, we've got this computer here. He said, you're more than welcome to have. It's a couple of years old, but it's a good machine. So I went and picked it up, and I, that's the exact machine I've been looking at. I took the specs. By the way, it's not even a year old. It won't be a year old until September. <laughs> I found that out. But you put all those specs into the computer and ask what it is, and a rebuilt one's $2,500. There's a new one sitting right there. So God's good. He is just working all the way around. It's the exact computer I wanted. The only thing it doesn't have is touchscreen, and I found out that if you got high graphics and touchscreen, they don't work well together. That's why it doesn't have it. So hallelujah. I'm the happy camper. Amen. Anybody have any questions? Was that temperature accurate on that? What's that? Was the temperature that was on that accurate? Yeah, that was very accurate. We we went, That was last year. Yeah, last year, right around Thanksgiving time. Uh, actually, a year and a half ago, I'm sorry. And what happened, we got over there, we had, we had 60 days to get out of the building we were in before we had to start paying big rent, which we couldn't afford, and get into the building that we had that had no heat. It was, and, uh, you know, and uh, so we got this container and got it in there and uh, got a forklift. We landed no November the 1st, and it was 12 below zero, which is, that's pretty normal for that time of year over there. And uh, day two, it was almost 20 below. Day three, it was 34 below zero, and it stayed there the entire time we were there, all the way through the end of the year. It was the coldest fall they've ever had in, their, in recorded history in Mongolia. And we're trying to move this stuff into a container. Man, was it cold. And my Mongolians have a great sense of humor. They're a little different than ours, but they have a great... I kept turning around looking, where's my gloves? I go get another pair, put them on, and 
10 and said, where's my gloves? I can't find my gloves. These guys are stealing my gloves as quick as I can put them on. So finally I got a good pair, put them on my hands, said, not taking them off. I'm just going to keep them on. Chukso started talking to me. Chuka's my guard. Chuka's just a little guy. He come up behind me, pulled both my gloves off and ran away. <laughs> yeah, that was definitely cold. <laughs> They kept me from lifting heavy stuff by stealing my gloves. You don't grab metal at 35 below zero. Did you know that? Not if you want to let go of it anytime soon. <laughs> Any other questions? Amen. I do really wish you would pray for us because that is a huge undertaking. We have a big God. He knows what he's doing. And uh, we just want to make sure that we keep up with him. Amen. If you have your Bibles, open to Daniel chapter 3. And I'm only going to be a few minutes I got three points. My entire outline is that long. That's it. It's not a big one. So uh, we'll try to get you out of here before the Methodists beat you to the buffet. Amen. <laughs> Daniel, Daniel chapter 3. You know, I did this wrong. I just feel like that. I wish you'd keep my wife and I in your prayers. Of course, my wife has congestive heart failure, and that has been giving her a fit the last three or four weeks. She's really been struggling with it, and uh, it, she has a hard time breathing and things like that at certain times. So just keep her in your prayers. And then pray for me just before we left for Michigan. Uh, I woke up on a Thursday morning and had absolutely zero hearing on this side of my head. I mean, you could you could have put a foghorn there and let it go. I wouldn't have heard it. It was amazing. I, and I didn't realize how much not hearing affects everything you do. You're walking and everything is affected by your hearing. And uh, so I had no hearing. And so I thought, uh, well, we'll make an appointment with my doctor to see him. And, and about noon, I guess at 12.30, I started seeing spots in my vision. So I called the doctor back and he said, just go to the hospital, just go to Raleigh, which is the last place in the world I really want to go is Raleigh General, amen? But, <laughs> you know, I went to Raleigh General and I told them what was going on and they got me in a tree. I said, the, the, have you been to Raleigh lately? I mean, you go in the waiting room, it's packed. There's not even a chair available. But they got me right into the triage, and he was in there about 30 seconds, and he said, just a second, he stepped out, he goes, we got a room just for you, and I was in, they put me on stroke alert, okay? And so for three days, they run every little test known to man, including that little tube that's about that big, they shove you in, and it goes, all the way around, you know, all that stuff. That thing's mean, man, I'm telling you what. I thought they was gonna have to butter that thing up and get me out of there, you know? It was, I was scratching all sides of that thing, you know. And they did that for about 10 minutes, and then he pulled me out and said, we're going to shoot something in your arms and stick you back in there. I said, I'm not going back in there. You can shoot anything you want in my arms. I ain't going back in there. I'm done. And uh, But anyways, three days later, they said, you can go home. You didn't have a stroke. You didn't have a heart attack. And they went all down this hole, this stuff. And I'm going, I still can't hear nothing over here. Oh, well, you have to go see an ENT for that. I said, this is what I came in for, you know. I mean, it's like going going in for an oil change and getting four new tires and getting paid, billed for it, you know. I didn't get that. But just pray for it. I'm getting some. i got about half my hearing back. I do wear hearing aids anyway, so I've got this one cranked all the way up. This one turned down so that it's somewhat balanced. Amen. So just uh, pray that we can figure that out and figure out what's going on there and that uh, we can keep on going. Have you found Daniel chapter 3? We're going to start at verse 8 and read down through the end of the chapter through verse 30. And then we'll just have a few things and then we'll let you go, okay? Wherefore at, certain, at, at, wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And by the way, that golden image, in case you're wondering, is 90 feet tall. This is not some little statue. It's 90 feet tall, and in that day and age, it would have been the tallest thing in that town. So you could see it from anywhere in town. It was very readily, uh, you, you see it standing there. And whosoever falls not down and worship, that he shall be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. 
There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy God, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my God, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready, at, at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sapphire, the sultry, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver ye, you, out of my hand? We're about to answer that question, by the way. That's the whole question we're getting ready to answer. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, I'm working on a sermon, but if not, what are you going to do if God doesn't answer your prayers? What are you going to do? Are you going to keep serving God or are you going to quit? Are you going to cry and pout? Or are you going to continue? You know, something you got to consider. You know, we as Americans and as humans, we think that God is more concerned about our bodies than our spirits. Not so. God's more concerned, more concerned about our spirit and our relationship with Him than our physical bodies. If not so, but if not, be known unto thee, O King, that we will not serve that God, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats and their hose and in their hats and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king was astonished, and rose up in haste, and spake, and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace, and spake, and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Now, just so you know that I'm not of the caliber that would be in the fire, because if that was me in there, I'd say, hey, you want to talk to me? You come down here and talk to me. You know what I mean? <laughs> they didn't do that. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors, being gathered together, saw these men upon whose body the fire had no power. Nor was a hair of their head singed, neither was their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants and that trusted in him, and have changed, changed the king's word, and yielded their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. By the way, yielded their bodies is a key word there that should be underlined in your Bible because that's what they did. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their house shall be made a dunghill because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. There's the answer to his question. He gave his own answer. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the province of Babylon. There's three things I want to show you here. And you, you're going to see this. This is, this is a perfect trial. This is a perfect trial. We're going to see three, three things about it. And by the way, everybody in here is either in a trial, about to be in a trial, or coming out of a trial. That's the state of our lives as a, as a Christian and as a human being. We're in trials every day. We're in trials all the time. A 
woke up with no hearing on this side of my head. That's a trial. My wife, my wife goes down up in Michigan and, and ends up six days on life support. That's a trial. And then there's smaller ones. We had all kinds of trials. You know, we had nine children. That's a trial. Seven of our girls. That's a bigger trial. <laughs> Amen. I mean, just saying. And, you know, we all have trials. But I want to show you a few things about this trial right here. It was, look at verses 15 and 16. We're going to see the perfect stand that they took. Now, if you be ready, this is Nebuchadnezzar speaking, that you be ready at what time you hear the sound of the corn, the flute, the harp, the sacrament, the psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if you worship not, you shall be cast in the, the same hour into the midst of the burning fire of furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hand? Now, I want you to listen to this response. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. There's a whole bunch of things that jumped off the page at me when I read that. The first thing is, O Nebuchadnezzar. They didn't say, O king. Everybody else in these scriptures, as you're reading this, O king, live forever, all this baloney. No, not them. O Nebuchadnezzar. Because they knew he wasn't God. He was being talked to as a God. He's not God. O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. They already knew what they were going to do before they got there. They had predetermined what they would and would not do. Hey, let me tell you what, that'll help you go a long way in your Christian life with trials. If you'll just predetermine what you're going and not going to do. I, I, I'm a little old, obviously, white hair, white beard. I was raised in the 60s and 70s, the hippie age. How many of you remember hippies? Come on, all y'all people, raise your hands. You're with me on this one. You remember those hippies, you know? I was raised in the middle of that. And I predetermined as a grade schooler, there's one thing I wouldn't do. There's a whole lot of things I wish I had predetermined, but this one thing I would not do. I was not going to do drugs, period. I don't care what kind of drugs. I wasn't going to do them. Now, was I afraid of drugs? No. I was afraid that my dad would catch me and kill me. That's the truth. You know, I figured my dad would not stop working me for three years if he ever caught me doing drugs. You know what I mean? So I, did, I predetermined I would not do drugs. I grew up in an environment where everybody was smoking marijuana and doing all that other baloney they were doing. And, oh yeah, make fun of me? Oh yeah, they made fun of me. They'd smoke a joint, pass it to me, they knew. I said, no, no thank you. Oh, mama's boy. You want me to tell you how I responded to mama's boy? Yep. I love my mama. Always have. Always will. I wasn't afraid to tell them that. You know, it, you know how long they made fun of me? Two days. That was it. Two days. That's all. Predetermine in your heart what you will and will not do. You know, they came through our school. You can tell this is in the early, early, early 70s. Might even have been 1969. I can't remember. But they came through our school raiding lockers looking for drugs. Now, today they can't do that because they get sued because if they're right there, they're locked. Baloney. But anyways, uh, they, they started going from locker to locker, going through the school. They got to my locker. And they went to open it. One of the kids passing by went, you're wasting your time there. I want to say, hallelujah, he's right. Why? Predetermine what you're going to do. Know that what you'll stand, what you won't stand for. Don't be afraid of other people. What are they going to do, make fun of you? Are you kidding me? Who cares? What are they going to do? They might hurt me. All right. I don't think so. You know, we worry too much about what other people are going to do. We should worry more about what God's going to do. There's the one I'm worried about. I ain't worried about what some punk kid in the seventh grade is going to think about me because I won't smoke a joint. I'm worried about what God's going to think about me when I get to heaven and says, Hey, what did you do that for? You could have witnessed to him. Why did you do that? You know, that's what I'm worried about. So, we need to have a perfect stand. We need to predetermine what we're going to go These guys had predetermined in their hearts what they would and would not do. It's really good because they said, we're not careful in this matter. You ask, I'm going to give you an answer, King. Now, King, this guy, she's sharp. This is the same way the devil works. He got these three boys. He said, he brought them in to where the king was at. And then closed the doors. It's just them in there. He said, now we're going to play the music. All they want you to do, just one time, just one time, bow down. Everything will be all right. But if you don't, 
I'm going to fry you like frog legs. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to stick you in that fire until there ain't not, nothing left of you. I'm trying to scare them. Didn't scare them, did it? Don't worry about what other people say. Worry about God. That's just the way the, the devil works today. He's a lot of hot air. He ain't going to do nothing. He's a lot of hot air. Well, you know, we're just going to do it this one time. Nobody's watching. God was in that room with them. They just didn't see him until the fire came. Then they saw him. So, first thing we see is it's, it's a perfect, perfect stand that they took. Then look at 17 and 18. And be, if it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from this burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy God, nor worship the golden age which thou hast set up. Wow. They had faith in God. You know, these guys were not dumb. They were smart. Here's what they said. We know our God can deliver us. Now, whether or not he does, that's up to him. He's the one in charge, not me. But he will deliver us from you, O king. You know what that means? Let me, let me, let me explain that to you. They're standing there getting told, if you don't worship, we're going to burn you. We're going to throw you in this fire. And they're saying, we're not worried about you, king, because God's going to deliver us from you today. You know why they said that? Because if they throw them in the fire and they burn up, they're going to heaven. They never have to deal with the king again, do they? But if they throw them in the fire and they don't burn up, what's the king going to do about it? What's he going to do next week? Threaten to throw them back in the fire? Hey, you don't have to throw us in. You don't have to mind us. We're going our own. You know? God delivered them from the king, and they knew that that was going to happen. One way or another, that was going to happen. It was a perfect faith in God. We need to understand God's with us. God's right there with us all the time. Just like he was with these young men. He wasn't, this, this trial wasn't there to, to, to test God's ability. It was there to test their faith. It was there to test their faith. i got to be honest with you. If I'm looking at that fire being heated up, and I'm thinking, man, there ain't nobody in this room but me and the king, I'm, you know, that, I would have a very difficult time with that one. I really would. I'm not going to stand up here and say I'd jump in the fire with him. I, I, I'm not sure I would. I'm not sure how strong I'd be in that case. These guys were ready for it. They were so close to God that they were ready for it. And it's, it's interesting. <laughs> then you see, look at verses 24 and verse 25. This is after they threw in the fire. They didn't burn up. Then they, Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto him, King, oh, true, O oh, king. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loosed walking in the midst of the flame. They have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. When did God show up? When did God show up in this story? He's been there the whole time. He's been there the entire time. But he became apparent to other people when the fire came down. Oh, let me tell you what. When you're going through one of the heavy trials, the people around you know what's going on. They see God in you. When they see the hurt in your family or the hurt in your life, and you're not reacting like they think you should. It's like, they're going to be looking at you like, what's your problem? I got a problem. You know, what do you mean? Well, why aren't you? Well, let me tell you why. His name's God, and he's on my side. I'm on his team, and we're working together. Gives you an opportunity to witness, doesn't it? I think it's interesting here. He said the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. How did the king know that that was God in the fire with him? How did he know that? Did, did you think God, because this is Nebuchadnezzar, this is the most powerful man in the world at this day and age. Do you think God had maybe come down and presented himself to Nebuchadnezzar and say, I'm God, just in case you want to know. No. 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 But let me tell you what. When an unsaved person comes across a situation where there's no other answer except God, they know it's God. They know it's God. You don't have to explain God to them. They'll already know that. Here it is. He's looking down and he's saying, The form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Wow. Did God not bring him through this trial? 
Now, let me ask you a question. If God can and God did bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego through this trial, and this is a real trial, folks. This is real fire. Hey, I can tell you it's real because the men that tried to put them into the fire were killed from the flames. And they didn't even go in the fire. They were killed from the heat. It's a real, real thing. So, if God can bring these young men through trial of this magnitude, do you think he can handle your problems? Do you think maybe our problems look a little bit petty compared to theirs? I mean, some of the things we call trials are like, you know, okay, if you want to call it a trial, okay, I call it stupidity, but okay. You know, I mean, really, I, I, sometimes I just, some of the things we pray for, you wonder if God's not going, really? Come on, you can do better than that. You know, I just believe if God can deliver these three men out of a furnace of fire, He can deliver us from our trials. And I made a little bit of fun of some of our trials, but the truth is God does want to know about our, our feelings and our trials. He really does. He really wants to comfort us. He really wants to be with us. He really wants to deliver us. I want to show you. Look at the very beginning. This is the conclusion. Look at verses 20. Look at 29 and 30. This is the conclusion to a perfect trial. This is the king speaking again. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces. Their houses shall be made a dunghill because there is no other God that can deliver after this sword. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. That's pretty harsh. You say something amiss? You say something bad about this God? He said, I'm going to cut you into pieces and I'm going to use your house for a uh, sewer dump for the cows. That's some pretty harsh stuff, isn't it? That's, that's the king. That's not God. That's the king. And by the way, I think he was pretty accurate. I think that's exactly what he should have done. You know? And then look at the, the next part. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Two things that happen in a perfect trial. God gets the glory. Man gets the promotion. Amen. Now we don't do what we do. None of this was done because they had a promotion in mind at the end. If you go into a trial with that in your mind, you're probably going to burn up in the trials what's going to happen. But they went into it with glorifying God. And God's not a debtor. He in turn promoted them. Isn't that great? I don't know what trial you're going through today. I don't know how big it is. I don't know how small it is. I don't know anything about it. I know that there's a big God in heaven above that wants nothing more than help you through that trial. And has every plan to promote you in the end when you're successful with it. Amen? Heavenly Father, I thank you again for this church and allowing me to be here. And I pray that you'll bless each one. In thy name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Well, it's been a good place to be. Appreciate everybody sticking around. Uh, remember, we have choir practice for adults of five, youth of five thirty. Then we'll have to be back here at six o'clock to hear Brother Kirchner once again. Sure, I'm going to make your way to the back so they can reach on the way. Yes. Yeah.